This is The Zero Hour with RJ Eskow, produced by the We Act Radio Network in Washington, D.C., and broadcast across the nation. Visit us online at thisisthezerohour.com or at youtube.com slash thezerohour. Ladies and gentlemen, RJ Eskow. This is Richard R.J. Eskow, and welcome to the Zero Hour. We've got another great hour coming up for you in this segment of the show. But first, a random thought and some random science news. My random thought is this. You know, I was just thinking the other day, I have random thoughts from time to time. If I were a professional photographer, <clears throat> here's what I'd do for a concept piece. I'd get a zoo that was willing to put me in a cage. So I'd go in a cage with my camera equipment. Then I'd photograph all the people who came to look at me. But I'd set the depth of field and, you know, I'd manage it so that the background is faded out in depth of field. So I'd make it look like they were in the cage instead of me. Then I'd just take pictures of all the people who came to me all day and I'd make an exhibit of it. I'd call my exhibit Zoo. Now think about that for a while. That's just a little bit of zen. Now it's time for random science news. Uh, let's see. What can we tell you? Okay, first of all, you may have read about this. Chubby Checker, the great uh, rock and roll rhythm and blues singer of the early 1960s, settled his lawsuit, uh, which he brought against Hewlett Packard in 2013. The Hollywood Reporter reports that he has settled his trademark infringement suit, which he filed after Hewlett Packard included an app for estimating the size of a man's penis and called it the Chubby Checker in its web OS store. He has, he sued them for half a billion dollars. And what I love about this story is that, um, first of all, it shows that when it comes to lawsuits, size does matter. But secondly, it shows that people have this inflated idea. Of course, we're in a tech stock bubble. Janet Yellen, the head of the Federal Reserve, pointed that out last week. But he thinks there's a half a billion dollars in it. Terms of the settlement were not disclosed, uh, but, and neither side admits to wrongdoings, but they're not going to use the chubby checker uh, trademark again. However, the app, which was worth uh, sold for 99 cents, was downloaded less than 100 times uh, between 2006 and 2012 when it was withdrawn. So if you're one of the guys who downloaded the app, this is now the real time for you to be embarrassed because less than 100 guys did, making HP a profit of no more than $30. And and, and chubby uh, checker sued for half a billion. That's how distorted people are. Now, get this. <clears throat> Secret papers received, released just recently show that the United States had plans, uh, the United States military specifically had plans to build a secret moon base by 1964. I'm not kidding you. This was reported by CNN. Uh, they wanted to make a secret manned moon base. And then once it was built in secret, they called it Project Horizon, they were going to explode a thermonuclear bomb on the surface of the moon to impress the entire world with the military might of the United States. Um, no clue as to whether there were secret alien Nazis in a hidden uh, undersea cave in the waters of the Mare Imbrium, which don't exist, of course. But uh, anyway, I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, now, also, if you feel like a hotshot because you made a lot of money in the Silicon Valley and you built a fancy house, human beings are not the only creatures who build their own housing. Uh, a Science Daily reported that bacteria, a scientist discovered that bacteria manipulate salt in order to build their own shelters to hibernate in. They literally create salt, um, uh, use salt, manipulate salt in order to make little hidey places for themselves. And the last story uh, of the day, I love this one. Congress Edits is a Twitter bot that lets people know whenever someone from a, uh, from a uh, URL who's in Congress, member of Congress, or working for a member of Congress, changes Wikipedia. Now, they, the, the, they have uh, changed a Wikipedia entry in order to uh, document the members of Congress are not reptiles. I kid you not. The idea, here's the passage in question and the sentence that the congressional editor added. The, the idea of reptilians on Earth was populated by D David Ick, a conspiracy theorist who says, shape-shifting reptilian people control our world by taking on human form and gaining political power to manipulate our societies. Uh, he has claimed on multiple occasions that many world leaders are possessed, are or are possessed by reptilians ruling the world. Here is the change made by somebody working in or for Congress. These allegations 
are completely unsubstantiated and have no basis in reality, said somebody within the halls of Congress. Then they turned to their assistant and said, get me another live mouse, I'm hungry. I'm Richard R.J. Escal. It was a random science news. We'll be right back after this. back on the zero hour joining us now is michael aria who writes for counterpunch and is the author of a book on msnbc called medium blue which you might guess by the title suggests that they are not offering entirely undiluted leftist critiques of current events michael thanks so much for joining us no no problem thanks for having me you bet Listen, I, I wanted to ask you about a couple things. Um, you're kind of an expert on MSNBC and what they don't do and don't do. And uh, you wrote a great piece last week about MSNBC and Gaza. But before we get to this, I wanted to get your thoughts on a piece that was uh, previewed from a book on the Clintons that's coming out uh, by David Halper. And there was a snippet of it released uh, just last week that said that and I'm quoting Hadass Gold, writing in Politico, Politico, Hillary and Bill Clinton went to the top of the M- NBC food chain all the way up to General Electric's board to get back at MSNBC's David Schuster in 2008. Now, I inherited this show from David Schuster. I like David. He's good. I think he's a good guy, but um, not a radical, not a subversive, not a vindictive guy, very nice man. Um, uh, does, did you see that story, and does that sound plausible to you? I saw the story. Um, I haven't read the book, I have to say. It seems like a pretty daunting task. I'm not sure I will. Um, but it, it seems in line um, to an extent. I think um, my book is kind of about how, um, at its core level, they don't really have a politics. Um, I don't think there's anything, especially political, about Phil Griffin. I think you'd be doing much of the same if they were running a conservative network. But um, on the level that they've developed into um, something of... Um, a news station since the election of Obama, um, and they've kind of rebranded themselves as a liberal alternative to Fox. Um, this A story like that um, falls in line with um, some other stories that we've heard, uh, including you know many of their hosts, including Matt Owen Hayes, meeting with um, the president on a, on a couple occasions to talk about policy and how things are being framed. So, yeah, there's, there's definitely um, connections. I mean, of course, Joy, Joy Reid, who's now a a full-time host of that station, used to work for the Obama campaign in 2008. So, you know, they have, in many ways, as many inroads into political establishment as as Fox does, I think, at this point. Well, I I, I think that's interesting. I think that's one of your points in the book as well. I, I, um, just so you and the audience know my other conflict of interest, I am good friends with Jank Uger, who is a host on MSNBC, Phil Griffin, the president, dismissed him even though he's doing well in the ratings because right. he wasn't playing ball with the political establishment. Um, Jenk and I have worked together a lot. So uh, I guess then the question that comes to mind on this story is it also says that there was very cynical messaging around uh, the attack on uh, David Schuster, basically that this would uh, uh, promote the, the the kind of gender identity politics that Hillary was pushing, but I, I guess going back to the MSNBC side of it, um, my biggest concern, I guess I would say about MSNBC, is that it's being presented at, to a lot of people as the liberal alternative, but you say it doesn't have an ideology except uh, proximity to one wing of the party. I mean, uh, the way that uh, Coca-Cola was closer to the Democrats, Pepsi-Cola was closer to the Republicans might be an analogy um, back in the 80s and 90s. But um, if so, what should people be looking for in their coverage as uh, Hillary Clinton becomes the nominee by acclamation of the Democratic Party? Um, I think in, the ter- in terms of MSNBC, um, you know, I think you bring up an interesting point about Fox. I, I, w- I would say that one of the reasons I wrote the book, um, which connects to your, to your points there, is that um, the interesting thing about the ideology at MSNBC is that it's not uh, direct uh, in the same way that like a lot of the stuff you see on Fox was. And I'm sure a lot of your listeners have seen out Fox or have read critiques of Fox News. Um, there's a lot of really good ones, but they tend to be pretty straightforward um, in terms of, I mean, in many situations, it's, it seems like just direct propaganda, like Republican operatives, like literally sending people emails telling them what to say. 
what not to say. And it seemed to me when I, um, that the critique of MSNBC from some people on the left by saying it was just Fox for the Democrats struck me as extremely inadequate to a certain extent because um, in the case of the right-wing kind of like noise machine, there was, it seems like there's a lot of people who are kind of in on the joke. I don't mean to suggest that they're like secretly progressive or something, but you get a lot of these quotes from people like Glenn Beck who say like, if anybody listens to any, everything I say, they're an idiot. You get Bill O'Reilly essentially admitting to Stephen Colbert that a lot of what he does is an act. You get Rush Limbaugh after the um, Democrats won the House and under the Bush administration saying that he's glad that the Republicans lost because he's tired of promoting messages he doesn't agree with. So in the case of that whole faction, you get a, a lot of times you see them kind of tipping their hand and kind of acknowledging that, hey, this is, we're just doing our jobs. This is kind of like a very, very cynical business that we have going here. In the case of MSNBC, what's extremely interesting is that in almost every article I read, every kind of like profile piece. There was a big one of the New Yorker last year. Um, there's been a couple, of, a big one in the New Republic. Almost every piece that interviews Matt or Hayes or any of the most prominent hosts, they make a point to kind of point out that they're never steered in a certain direction by Phil Griffin or anybody at the station. And it seems to me that they're under the impression they can do any kind of story that they want. And that, to me, is in many ways, although it might sound ridiculous to your listeners, it's, at a certain level, it becomes more insidious and Fox because there's no coercion going on. And I think in many ways that's why critiques of liberal establishment media are a little bit more interesting than critiques of conservative media because um, there's that kind of dichotomy. Well, let me run an example by we're talking with my writer Michael Aria about MSNBC and political affiliations, leanings, so on toward the Democrats. Uh, one of the things that struck me is that for a brief period I was on the email list for Democratic Party talking points and an error which has since been hastily corrected, I might add. But but during the NSA revelations about Ed, Edward Snowden, uh, what struck me about it, what stunned me about it is, you know, one of the great things that MSNBC hosts like Rachel Maddow sell is their sincerity, and, right. or seeming sincerity. And what stunned me, and then we'll get to Gaza if we have time, what stunned me was that Rachel and, and a couple of the other hosts, but especially Rachel because she seems more sincere than some of the other, uh, you know, O'Donnell or whomever, went down the line in the list of talking points. How should one person be allowed to take this upon themselves, which is a challenge to the whole whistleblower or person of conscience concept? Two, um, he's so young. Three, he seems like an egomaniac. Four, five points. He did them. I just don't know what to think was actually on the talking points memo. I don't know what to think about this. So uh, now when, when a Rachel Maddow does that, is this because she sincerely believes she's serving her country best by following these democratic uh, partisan and I would say uh, rather undemocratic talking points with a small d? Um, or, or is it because uh, she is playing a bigger game than her audience realizes? I really don't think they're playing a bigger game. People disagree with me. I mean, when I wrote the Gaza piece, for instance, I mean, when you write anything about Palestine, you get a lot of feedback um, from extremes <laughs> yeah. on every level. But, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I got a lot of people who say things like, you know, of course she covered it up, she's a Zionist, like, et cetera, et cetera. She's pro-Israel. I don't, I don't think, it, again, I don't think it's like that. I don't think it's that cynical. I think people like Maddow and Hayes are, tr you get the feeling, just uh, especially Hayes, who's talked to, who talks about this sometimes with his critics on Twitter. I mean, he's incredibly earnest and, they really th think there was a, there was a, um, I think I mentioned this in the Gaza piece, but she was on Bill Maher show a few months ago and the subject of Chris Christie came up in the bridge coverage and he was kind of pushing back on the idea that MSNBC was covering it so much. And she genuinely seemed like she had no idea what he was talking about. She insisted that she covered it, other political scandals the same way. Um, it just, it, it, and then when somebody on the panel kind of pointed out that, maybe the reason why MSNBC was covering it this way is because Christie was the prospective 2016 candidate. She just acted like it was the most ridiculous idea she'd ever heard in her life. So I really don't think it's a, it's a much deeper cynical game with them. I really think that they they are under the impression that what they're doing is... I don't even get the feeling that they think they're exceptionally liberal progressive. I, I It just seems to me that they think in many ways that they still believe in this kind of um, false theory of object objectivity in the American media. I mean, they're really, really committed to it. And I think what we see if we take a closer, closer look is that, you know, like, obviously there's no, no such thing as objectivity in the American media. And um, when it comes to a lot of the, if you look a little deeper in a lot of the context, especially when, like when, if we talk about Palestine, 
there is an ideology that comes out. It's just not as noticeable, I think, as, again, a place like Fox that is just going to be rapidly pro-Israel, and it's, it's going to be very apparent to the viewer what's going on. I think an ideology definitely emits from MSNBC. I don't think anybody would deny that, but I don't think that they're, um, the people who are involved are completely aware of um, what they're doing. Well, and I think that people think that that ideology is a progressive or left ideology. I would argue that it is not. And let's right. talk for a second about Palestine. Uh, sure. Rachel Maddow, you wrote a piece ignoring the story on Israel-Palestine. This was in the 16th of July that I read it. On the last day of June, after the kidnapping, she ran a three-minute segment, very short piece at the very end of her show. But we'll, she ended by saying, we'll keep you apprised of developments, and then basically never went back to it, even though there were horrific uh, you know, the, the, the burning death of the Palestinian teenager, the beating of an American Palestinian teenager, the, the then, of course, the horrific attacks. Um, so for at least a long period of time, I don't know how she's been in the last week, but for a long period of time, she was, and other MSNBC hosts, as you reported, were ignoring this critical, what I would say is one of the critical stories of, for the American left to follow and express their out into outrage that their government isn't acting m more aggressively to stop it. Um, again, would that be because she doesn't think it's important, because she somehow uh, believes it's in the best interests of her country? She seems like a nice person, yeah. that, that somehow it's in the best interest of her country just to uh, brush this aside, or what? Do you have any I theories? I mean, I, it just seems to me like she doesn't think it's as important. I mean, something that I've touched on in that piece is the things that she covered instead of Palestine. And this, to me, was kind of the most challenging part about my book, is, is trying to articulate this idea that um, I'm sure a lot of other people have picked up on this, but it seems to me that MSNBC, whether they do it consciously or not, uses kind of like the wackier elements as, of the right um, as a way to not talk about things like Palestine or, say, like the, um, the Chelsea Manning trial um, or the right. attack on Libya or a whole host of things. I mean, your listeners could probably name it dozen off the top of their heads. But um, you see consistent coverage of the, the bridge scandal in New Jersey. You see consistent coverage of um, wacky things that Sarah Palin says, um, even though she's not even a politician anymore. But there's one part of my book where I talk about on the day that Chelsea Manning was sentenced, Ed Schultz did, I think, five minutes on his uh, show about Pat Robertson, um, a caller to Pat Robertson, show, or uh, someone who wrote an email to Pat Robertson's show asking if, um, if they bought something at the Salvation Army, if there could still potentially be demons in, like, a sweater, or if there was a way to, like, exercise the sweater, which is a completely ridiculous story from a Pat Robertson, who's a personality that no one really takes seriously. I don't even think people on the right take him seriously anymore. Um, but it's just interesting to me that they kind of find ways to not talk about. I mean, it'd be one thing if you, if you know, if they're, you, they're being slammed with all kinds of news stories. But we're talking about them. We're talking about this, when we talk about Manuel in Palestine. We're talking about, uh, like you said, like days and days of chaos. And um, she ran an entire segment. The long, the lead into her show was about John McCain confusing two people's names on a panel. Um, so I think it's pretty right. apparent that a lot of the stuff isn't very relevant. Um, it's only relevant within the context of this world where what happens on the right is the most relevant thing to the rest of the world. So um, that's where the ideology, I think, uh, really comes from. And I would point out that on Maddo and Israel, the time, she doesn't mention Israel very often, but when she does, she kind of falls into, again, uh, there is an ideology that comes out, but it's, it's not um, as direct. She, she, likes, she did a big piece on um, Attack on Gaza, I think in 2009, where she, or perhaps 2012, where she talked about, um, you know, both sides. They've been fighting forever, these kind of same tropes that you see a lot in the right. media. I, I, media. I, yeah, and there's, right. there was a really good piece in Jacobin the other day by, I think, Greg Shupak, um, kind of rejecting the, the big critique of this both sides ideology, which is in itself isn't, of course, an ideology, because... Um, it's, you know, I mean, it's an evasion, I, I, I guess... Absolutely, yeah. And, and I guess I guess I would close by this, and, and you, I'm going to make a statement, you can tell me if you agree or disagree. It might be a little tougher than what you've been saying so far, but you might agree. Whenever I see these endless, eye-rolling, giggling pieces about silly Republicans and silly conservatives and demons and sweaters and all this, I see, uh, uh, to be honest, I see moral failing. I see right. somebody who's making fun of people they can't influence in order to 
avoid the and evade the tough work of challenging the people you might conceivably be able to influence. And I consider that a moral failure. Am I being too harsh? No, I don't think so. I think it's, it's certainly true. I think that the way that they assess these things is pretty interesting. And I would, I would also point out that in the case of Schuster or in the case of Iger being fired, or, or you can go through the list, um, of course, you know, the, or Hayes having to apologize for his comments about the language that we use when we talk about the military. It's it not only is there an ideology, not only is it a moral failing, but um, whenever, you know, like occasionally in MSNBC, somebody does touch like the third rail. And, you know, in that case, as we just saw in terms of Palestine, um, people tend to be reeled in. I mean, it's not, it's not as direct. I mean, like I said, like it's not like Republicans or Fox. People aren't necessarily being fired every other day. Um, and there's maybe not direct like email saying you have to say this at this time, but there is, I think you, if you watch the programming long enough or you know anything about the host, you kind of get the feeling that there is a set of parameters that they, that they just know they have to work within or else there's going to be some level of trouble. I would, I would agree with that. Unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. I will observe that having been on both networks, I haven't been on MSNBC in years, but the, uh, snacks in the green room are better at Fox. <laughs> Um, oh, okay. But just 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 for further up, uh, Michael yeah. Aria, author of Medium Blue, a great book on MSNBC and writer for Counterpunch. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and this is the Zero Hour. <laughs> We are back on the Zero Hour. I'm Richard R. J. Escow, and joining us now uh, from the great state of New York is constitutional law professor and gubernatorial candidate Zephyr Teachout. Zephyr, thanks so much for joining us. Oh, I'm thrilled to be on the show. Well, we're thrilled to have you. And listen, uh, life has been interesting for you lately. You originally were a candidate for the nomination of the Working Families Party. We've had those folks on. We're supporters of what what they do we know you are too and it looked like you might get that nomination as a third party candidate until governor andrew cuomo uh the incumbent managed to get a deal brokered by bill de blasio he worked something out he got that nomination and now you are challenging andrew cuomo for the democratic nomination uh for governor and uh, there have been a couple developments this week uh, so First of all, I wanted to start by asking you, before we get to those developments, uh, how do you feel the campaign is going? I know you've got an uphill fight in terms of name recognition and that kind of thing, but um, how are things going? Oh, it's going incredibly well. And um, just just to be clear, when I entered the Working Families Party nomination, I was already planning to challenge Governor Cuomo in the Democratic primary. I'm a Democrat. I, I do I support the Working Families Party, but I'm a Democrat, and I... I think, you know, in so many ways in a democratic state like New York, um, we have a governor who calls himself a Democrat, but is governed as a Republican. And um, uh, so I entered the race because, you know, I bring pretty traditional democratic policies and values like fully funded education and infrastructure. Um, so we, I joined the race with my lieutenant governor candidate, Tim Wu, now uh, five and a half weeks ago, I guess. And it has been going extremely well. Um, in our first month, we actually had more people contribute to my campaign than contributed to Andrew Cuomo's campaign in the prior six months. Now, having said that, he had a lot more corporate contributors, and his contributors tend to give 120000 and mine tend to give a hundred. Um, but it shows that there's relatively little deep support for him. You know, people like his name. I, I supported him four years ago. I, I loved his father. Um, but there isn't a lot of genuine enthusiasm, um, and New York is suffering right now, uh, whereas there is genuine enthusiasm uh, for our campaign, and um, and we're, we're having just gotten off the ground, it's gotten off to a great start. Well, those of us who follow either politics or Wall Street, uh, and I consider myself in that group, have been aware <laughs> of, of Governor Cuomo's shenanigans for a long time, whether it's standing yeah. up for Wall Street or shooting down... Uh, uh, actually, Bill de Blasio's uh, um, tax on the wealthy for education and spreading that cost among the rest of the population in the middle class instead. So, I, you know, uh, some of us have had our eye on Governor Cuomo for a long time. But, yes, you have. Uh, yes. 
you know, what's interesting to me is he may have his eye on you now because there was an interesting story about some demonstrators protesting you who appeared to all be young people coming from one of his major corporate oh, backers. Yes. Yeah, I've had two uh, press conferences in recent days, and in both ones there were a handful of, of, you know, of, of, of a bunch of kids with signs. Uh, you know, I didn't think much much of it. I just assumed that they were... Um, you know, Cuomo interns or something, but there was a great story yesterday or just this morning of uh, um, uh, some reporters followed them and they ended up going back to one of his big real estate backers. Um, in fact, one of the you know, top 25 donors to Andrew Cuomo's campaign. So it's, uh, yeah, I certainly never, I'm, I'm, anybody who knows me knows I love politics and I have no problem with con- controversial views, but it just epitomizes you know, what's happening in New York Democratic politics is that here we have a you know, big real estate basically being the force behind a Democratic governor in a state where rent is too high, uh, property taxes are choking so many families, and instead we have, uh, you know, developers' interests being served. Well, you know, that's, that is a valid point. And, um, you know, I have to say, Zephyr, that... Uh, uh, for a long time, uh, I thought, well, you know, I know, I know Zephyr, I think she's great, I love that she's running against Cuomo, I have my issues with Cuomo, but, you know, she doesn't have a chance, and uh, as much as I like her, but I gotta say, uh, I wonder if things are changing, because, and I'm thinking specifically, you can imagine, of the Moreland Commission, and the fact yes. that that your opponent, Governor Cuomo, uh, ran on an anti-corruption ticket at appointed an anti-corruption commission and then first interfered with that commission according to reports when it began investigating his own backers and then disbanded it altogether when things were getting uncomfortable now there's a heated uh, there's a there's hot reporting on it and yes. uh, an editorial in the times today do you think this could shift the race yes of course it could um you know it's a real scandal in new york uh, john stewart covered it last night the new york times yes, devoted three of its best uh, journalists, and I think they also had some help. Um, uh, William Rochebaum, Sue Craig, and Thomas Kaplan did a 7,000-word piece uh, going into great detail about how uh, Andrew Cuomo's top aide, Larry Schwartz, uh, was blocking investigations into Andrew Cuomo's closest business associates. So this is a v- basic violation of trust. And you have to remember, Elliot Spitzer resigned uh, after news came of personal indiscre- indiscretions. This is this is suggesting that uh, you know at least his top aide, and we don't yet know what Andrew Cuomo knew, how involved he was, what he directed. Um, he has been s- silent for uh, the two two days since the report came out. Um, he's canceled events. Uh, we don't yet know what he knew. We don't know how involved he was, but we do know at the very top of his administration. Um, there are those who are acting as if um, if you're close to Andrew Cuomo, you're above the law and a different set of rules apply to you. And you don't get a much more basic violation of public trust than that. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the, the race is, look, I mean, the, 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 unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of Democrats don't engage in Democratic primaries because they, uh, you know, unless you have a 50 percent chance of winning, they say, why even bother? But the whole point of primaries is to have a real wide open debate about policy and um, and to actually say, well, what do the people of the state want? What do Democrats want? And I have complete confidence if we're just talking about policy, um, that the more people who know about me, the more they say, yes, that's the kind of New York I want. I want a New York where we actually fund our schools. I want a New York where we actually invest in public transportation instead of let it crumble. Um, but this news, this scandal, um, is not going away anytime soon, and um, you know I'm I'm looking forward to winning the Democratic primary. Now, I, you know, one of the things I was planning to ask you a couple days ago when we arranged this was, you know, uh, what's your path to victory? The uh, I believe the primary date is September 9th, which is you know mm-hmm. what uh, five six weeks away. Um, yeah. Now, I'm just wondering, since you mentioned turnout, in fact, the turnout tends to be low in primaries, is that, you know, because he's been very far ahead of, in the polls, and of course, scandal can change that, but the other thing is, what's your uh, turnout strategy? Well, we, you know, we don't know whether it's going to be 500,000 or 700,000 who turn out, 
Um, we do know we have a very active base. And, and as you know, if you follow politics, all politics happens in the last two weeks, <laughs> especially in a race like this. Um, uh, that changes with a scandal like this. Um, but uh, most people aren't paying attention till the very end. And um, so th- those last few weeks are really essential. But we have a, some really strong bases in New York. One strong base is um, teachers and parents who uh, see how Governor Cuomo has been not only not an education governor, but an anti-education governor. He's taken money from, uh, he started his governorship proposing one of the largest tax cuts for the largest cuts to education funding in state history um, so he could pay for tax breaks for the big banks. Um, that is not popular. Uh, his active, uh, uh, I don't know, just distrust of teachers is not popular. Uh, you know, he likes blaming teachers for failing schools, treating teachers like they're the, they're the reason um, that uh, kids aren't getting what they need when, in fact, it's pretty basic. You have to have small class sizes. You have to have uh, guidance counselors. You have to have the resources that schools need. Um, is, so isn't one that pretty much is teachers and parents. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Isn't that pretty and, much a sort of corporate democratic, uh, corporate Democrats orthodoxy to blame teachers for schools instead of giving them the support and the resources they need? Isn't he kind of coming off that, what is inaccurately sometimes called centrist playbook uh, yeah, when, no, he, when not, he attacks there's nothing centrist about it, as you as you rightly point out. It's a pretty radical shift in the Democratic Party, and most of it's happened in the last six years. Uh, you know, although there were seeds of it before. So after the crash of 2008, the Democratic Party has really split, um, and one part of it veered far right, and the other part is returning to its roots, towards right. to FDR, traditional Democratic values, and we're part of that traditional Democratic core. Uh, but you're right that what we see happening with Andrew Cuomo isn't just about Andrew Cuomo. It's about a whole range of Democrats who, with a few socially uh, progressive policies, think they can still claim the Democratic mantle when they're leaving behind middle class families, uh, working class families, uh, poor people, um, you know, uh, the basic the, the basic elements of a strong social safety net. So uh, just to return to your question about strategy, um, we have teachers and parents who are on fire for this campaign. Uh, we collected over 45,000 signatures, and a lot of that was from teachers and parents volunteering to carry the petitions. Another part of our core uh, base strategy is the, um, we're sometimes called the fractivists, the anti-frackers. I have, uh, New York is one of the last, if not the last, shale-rich state that has not allowed hydrofracking. Um, it has, it's in a position to really lead ban fracking um, and move forward with a strong renewable energy uh, platform. And, you know, plans are actually there for what New York would look like uh, with a um, wind, water, solar plan. Um, and it's something I support. It's called the Solutions Project. I think it's fantastic. Um, and the, there's an extremely strong base of people who see what's happened with hydrofracking in other states, how dangerous it is, um, and are really, again, also on fire for this campaign. So right now, the leadership's very excited and engaged, and I've talked to a lot of fractivists. And uh, as we move towards the primary, uh, it's it's getting the the broader base engaged and understanding that they have a, they have one option. They have a Governor Andrew Cuomo, who's taken over a million dollars from pro-fracking interests and refuses, refuses to, after years of study, say what he, whether he thinks he's going to frack, which makes many of us suspect that he's pro-hydrofracking, or they have somebody who has a very clear and open position on our environmental future. Um, so those are those are two bases. The third is the um, base of, of the uh, millions of immigrants and immigrant rights activists in the state. Uh, Governor uh, Cuomo chose as his running mate, um, Kathy Hochul, who has not only run on the conservative line, but she's built her political career being anti-immigrant, which is not popular. Uh, the more people learn about her, uh, the less they are excited about her representing democratic values. And um, so we have a powerful base in the um, uh, in, uh, immigrants and immigrant rights communities. Now, I'm from upstate New York. I'm from Utica uh-huh. originally. And uh, uh, I, I know you got the endorsement of from Buffalo the Keep. City. Is that right? <laughs> there you go. And <laughs> and um, Utica Club. And um, yes. uh, 
You, you got the endorsement of a city even further upstate, the teachers in Buffalo. Utica yes. is a big immigrant community. So, you yes. know, a lot of things, what a lot of people don't realize when they think about New York politics is that upstate is a big deal. And oh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, you've been spending any time upstate in my old uh, oh, yeah. homeland? I, I haven't been to Utica, although I was just on Utica Radio yesterday morning. Um, but I've been to Buffalo a couple times. Um, and uh, we're basically going upstate uh, once every week. Uh, um, for uh, we already have been, and, and we're going even more now. Um, so it's a, you know, it's one New York, um, as Elliot Spitzer used to say. It's uh, you know, if you if we see downstate and upstate as two different states, then both are diminished. Uh, you know, one of our plans for New York um, is real investment in transportation economy. We have one of the largest transportation economies in the world, and yet it's a sort of embarrassment for a, a city and state of this stature to have the weak public transportation we do. So we have a vision of a 21st century, uh, making New York State the hub of 21st century transportation. Um, and that's going to uh, bring jobs to upstate and jobs to downstate. So I, I think of them as the more connected we can see the state the more powerful we all are well how could there are going to be people listening to this program from around the country who might want to help uh or find out more where can they go to do that oh yes i've been remiss <laughs> no no i'm here to <laughs> I'm <ha> they, uh, <laughs> encourage you no i mean the, the truth is let, let's put a finer point on it I don't have $35 billion like Governor Andrew Cuomo. There's a reason he has $35 billion. The reason is he serves the interests of those who can make large campaign donations of over $100,000. There are basically no campaign finance laws in New York. Um, and uh, so I, it's not just if you want to, but we, we rely on you. Like This is an important campaign for the soul of the Democratic Party in the heart of Democratic country. And we rely on people uh, from around the state and around the country to get engaged. Um, so they can go to my website, ZephyrTeachout.com, or, you know, follow me on Twitter, ZephyrTeachout. I got this I got this name like my millstone around my neck, but I'm carrying it wherever I go. So if you can spell it, you can follow us, Z-E-P-H-Y-R-T-E-A-C-H-O-U-T. Um, well, look, my name's Zescal, so that's not so <laughs> great either. Uh, and by the way, both of themselves lend to stupid puns which uh, <laughs> <I do. laughs> um, so, so listen said, another th what well, go, go ahead uh, no so what besides, were you gonna besides following us you know the the thing that is most important is we everybody who learns about us not everybody but when people learn about us there's extraordinary excitement you know there's a real democratic alternative to this democrat in name only in uh new york and to this you know, governor with a scandal very close at his heels. So our biggest challenge is just getting known about, getting people to know that there's a, uh, a female law professor who has a long history of organizing and political engagement who's running against Cuomo. That alone, and you, you get this sense of excitement, like we can have a better New York. So wherever you are in the country, if you let your you know, media organization know or a national media organization know, um, we're more likely to get heard. Well, you know, uh, uh, look. Let's do the do this anyway. Since you you mentioned a long period and a long long history of political organizing, I think I first became aware of you when you were involved with the Howard Dean campaign, and then we wrote for the same ill-fated political website. But I mean, you go back <laughs> at least ten years uh, yeah. in Democratic in the Democratic wing of the Democratic Party, as we say, right? I mean, I'm probably leaving out. Yeah. A lot of stuff. No, that's but, right. I uh, spent, you know, I spent my early career as a as a death penalty lawyer, but you know, really for the last eleven years, I've been more involved in taking on big money in uh, banking and big money in politics, and um, helped found a, a break up the banks group after the crash. I was the national director of the Sunlight Foundation, which is a big anti corruption group, and then you know a central part of our economy right now, of course, is the internet, which a lot of politicians you know, still seems like they're in 1996, and I think of it as an add-on. And I've also been involved with Fight for the Future and other organizations that have uh, led the fight against SOPA and PIPA and led the fight for net neutrality. Um, Tim and I uh, are uh, fighting to stop the Comcast Time Warner merger, for instance, in New York State, which many people don't realize this, but states have the power to have their own uh, policy. 
um, or an antitrust policy. And right now, the Public Service Commission in New York is considering whether or not to block the Time Warner Comcast merger. Um, so uh, I've been very involved in, in that as well. So can I can I just engage the law professor for a second? I think, which is in sure. one sense inseparable from the candidate, but. I just, I look at astonishment and our government's unwillingness, it seems to me, but correct me if I'm wrong, to, to enforce the basic antitrust principles that have been, were in place for a yes. century in this country. It seems to yes. me astonishing that, that they, we could even be comp- contemplating something like the Comcast merger. Yes, that's right. No, it's a, um, one of the great tragedies of the last, let's see, since 81, that's, 91, to help me count, uh, 33 years. 23 years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, 33 years, excuse me, yeah, I'm not yeah. doing any better. 33 years, yeah. So in 1981, Ronald Reagan rewrote the antitrust guidelines. And in doing so, he wrote political law, he wrote, rewrote business law, he wrote, rewrote the foundation of really the, the most vibrant time in American uh, economic history. He wrote out... Uh, all considerations in antitrust except efficiency. So antitrust traditionally, going back to before it was called antitrust, when Jefferson wanted an anti-monopoly clause in the Constitution, antitrust has always been a principle that favors innovation, that favors resiliency, that favors democracy. And according to Ronald Reagan, antitrust stands for one thing, which is efficiency. That's it. And bigger is more efficient. In other words, there are no antitrust laws. Right. So the, the 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 great tragedy, though, is that Democrats have been complicit in forgetting that we have this power. And one of the things that Tim and I are bringing back, besides this genuine resistance to uh, the corporate Democrat and the and the corruption, um, is we have this positive vision. And part of the positive vision is is reviving the antitrust of Teddy Roosevelt, of FDR, of Madison, of the abolitionists, all of whom understood that. Monopolies are a great, great threat to democracy. And this Comcast merger is example A of why it's a threat. It's bad for workers. It's bad for people at home. It's bad for small businesses who can't afford their cable bills. And it's terrible for democracy because it means that one you know, big company controls what we see, uh, what we hear, and what political information we learn. You know, try going on and- MSNBC to talk about Comcast. Uh, or uh, time war no it's it's a it's a major problem when Democrats can't talk about you know core democratic right. issues because it, it's controlled by uh, uh, a particular business interest yeah I'm I, I didn't mean to laugh because I take it lightly but because it's so pro it's so profound a problem and I would argue you're you as you know from all your internet work that that when a Comcast a corporation becomes um, monolithic and monopolistic then in given markets then it even affects what uh, what people's search ability people's online ability people's yeah. uh, access to uh, you yep. know, entertainment it, it, you name it it's 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 almost like a kind of panopticon control that yes. they, you know um, well, there's a simple so, way to think about it. You know, like you and I talk about antitrust and monopoly, and we've been talking about it since we met. <laughs> but but right. for for uh, for most people, it's just it's just about power. Um, you know, it's it's about too much centralized power. That's a basic democratic principle. That doesn't mean sometimes people confuse power and government. Government works when it's accountable. Uh, because then people actually retain power in the government. Um, and the problem is when you have any company that takes up too much power. Right. Right. And and, and, and I think that's really important for people to understand. But, you know, Zephyr, it, it's not, Zephyr Teach Out, it's not just a Democratic principle. I mean, I think there no. there is what when used to be a Republican I mean small principle. D. Yes. <laughs> yes, but, yes, yes. But in yeah. addition to that, Demo- yeah. there, there is a core conservative principle called competition. Yes, yeah. No, well, you know I believe in competition because I'm in a primary that was not supposed to be competitive, and I think competition is the core of democracy, and it's the core of a, of a strong economy, too. So you have a vision of how you would take the government. If the governor of New York decides to enforce antitrust law, that could um, ha- certainly have profound national ramifications meanwhile your candidate is your 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 uh, opponent rather is now facing the fact that as of this morning or as of today 
uh, the U.S. Attorney, Preet Bharara, says that he's going to take over the anti-corruption work that Governor Cuomo shut down uh, when he disbanded the Moreland Commission in April. So this is going to be an interesting month. Uh, Zephyr Teachout, uh, good luck, the best of luck with your campaign. And if people want to know more, they can go to Zephyr, Z-E-P-H-Y-R, teachout.com. Um, and thanks so much for joining us. Oh, I was thrilled to be on the show. It's great to talk to you. Great to talk to you, too. Thanks again. It's Zephyr Teachout, thanks. constitutional law professor candidate for governor. We'll be right back after this. I am Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour. This is The Zero Hour with R.J. Escal, produced by the WEACT Radio Network in Washington, D.C., and broadcast across the nation. Visit us online at thisisthezerohour.com or at youtube.com slash thezerohour. Ladies and gentlemen, R.J. Escal. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to The Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Escal. We've got a great show lined up for you. But before that, you know, I think I owe our listeners an apology the crisis in Gaza has been building up for some time now, and to be honest about it, I've been kind of afraid to talk about it. I didn't tell myself I was afraid, of course. You know, we don't usually do that in situations like these. I did what we so often do. I didn't tell myself that the subject is too controversial or that it's too incendiary or that I don't want to alienate my audience and maybe risk my own well-being in some way. Instead, I told myself that people listen to me or read me to whatever extent they do because of the credibility I've gained on economic issues, on Social Security, Medicare, on Wall Street, on poverty, education, and other types of domestic policy. But the truth is, I thought of that subject as a political minefield, and honestly, I just didn't want to step in it. I also didn't want to alienate friends and family who feel very differently on the subject from me. But I know what's going on here. I've worked overseas. I've been a contractor for the State Department. I know enough about national security and international relations to know what, what's going on in Gaza as a horror show. I also know enough to know that it's a very, very one-sided situation, that innocent people are being hammered in Gaza and slaughtered by an overwhelmingly superior military force in contravention of international law and, in my opinion, basic human decency as well. Now, let's not go to that place where it says somehow that's supposed to mean I support Hamas. Of course I don't. That's Unfortunately, that's the disclaimer everybody has to make, as ridiculous as it is to even suggest it. But it, our politics makes you go there. The truth is, I felt for a long time that a nonviolent Palestinian resistance would make a lot more sense, would be extraordinarily effective, and I have a huge problem with anybody who targets innocent civilians on any side of a conflict. But the fact remains, we have a moral obligation to challenge Israel's policy here. It's Israel which is destroying hospitals and schools right now in violation of international law. And it's Israel which receives massive U.S. financial support. That means support from you and me. That gives us a moral responsibility in this situation. What's more, if you support Israel's right to exist, you have a very special reason to want this madness to stop. Its military actions are doing far more to undercut world support than anything Hamas has done or frankly could do. The future is becoming increasingly clear. If Netanyahu and his colleagues go on this way, Israel will suffer. But that's the future. Today, children and other innocents are dying. Why? Because of the immoral philosophy of collective guilt. Collective guilt is something that should have been put away with the other misguided ideas of the 20th century. We need to end this madness now. So on today's program, we'll talk about slanted coverage of the Gaza situation. We can't call it a conflict, really, because right now it's so one-sided, but I make you this promise. From now on, I'll try to be more courageous, even when, especially when, I have all sorts of good reasons not to be. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour.
And we are back on the Zero Hour. Joining us now is Zed Jelani, who is a writer and activist. He has written for Salon, The Huffington Post, The Nation, he Think Progress. He has been an activist with the Progressive Change Campaign Committee following the wiretap scandal in 2013. He presented a, signature, a petition with over 100,000 signatures against government spying on its own citizens. Uh, Zed, thanks for joining us. Yes, great to be here. Well, and uh, great to have you, although circumstances not so great. We've been talking a little bit on the show about Gaza and about the um, surprising, even to me, I think, and I'm pretty jaded, um, slant that I seem to see in coverage of the Gaza crisis and the attack on Gaza in the United States uh, media. And I know you've had some thoughts about that. Am I uh, off base to think that we're basically only getting uh, one side of the story here? Well, I, I think um, the important thing is that people understand that um, if you look at the broader picture, we typically don't get the the full story here. I mean, um, I you can recall when Kerry made his remarks a few months ago uh, to a private group and it was recorded saying that Israel could be heading towards apartheid if it doesn't uh, settle with the Palestinians. You'll re, you'll see even during that time, the majority of guests on to to talk about Kerry's comments were either Israelis or supporters of the Israeli government. Um, and I think that this imbalance has been around for such a long time that we almost sort of don't notice it. And I think we've noticed it a lot during this conflict, but I think it's even more deadly that it's something that sort of persists even when there isn't sort of live fire going on. Even when, uh, you know, we have, for example, political conventions, we have politicians constantly talking about Israel, very rarely talking about the Palestinians. Um, when we have debates between political candidates, we have resolutions before Congress. Uh, Congress and both houses just unanimously passed a resolution backing the Israeli side of the conflict rather than taking an even-handed approach or an approach that at least recognizes that Palestinians have legitimate grievances here. Um, so I think, you know, this is sort of a symptom of a wider problem. That being said, I think we have seen some good pockets here and there. I mean, Chris Hayes has brought on several good Palestinian guests, including people speaking straight from uh, the West Bank and from uh, the reporter Ayman Mohadeen in Gaza. Um, and I think uh, a couple of other, of the other hosts also uh, have done a little bit more than I would expect. Jake Tapper had some very good aggressive interviews um, with Israeli spokesmen. And I think that, uh, you know, there are some people in the media, particularly people who are in Gaza. Um, the media was actually able to be situated within Gaza this time, which it wasn't able to in 2008 during Operation Cast Lead. Um, you know, so I think the door, the door is starting to creak open a little bit. But, yeah, I definitely share that critique overall. Well, I think, and you've raised a number of great points there, Zed, and I'd like to just kind of try to go over them. One is the uh, political class for, you know, our, our elected officials who I think have basically made the calculus that they it's just too dangerous for them to critique an Israeli policy. And uh, so we see resolutions like the one we saw passed through Congress, but the the other piece of the equation is the media. And we, but we've seen, you know, it's interesting because uh, you mentioned something that I think is very m important to bring up, which is after years of what I would characterize as one-sided coverage of this issue, uh, we're seeing a, the kind of shift now where, for example, I believe it was M MS, uh, it was NBC who had a reporter uh, doing. Uh, excellent coverage in Gaza, who covered some children being killed on a beach and so on, and was pulled and then uh, uh, on what seemed to be fictitious circumstances because they said, because it was too dangerous, but then they put Richard Engel in there, who's much better known, and he was brought back. So there was a lot of uh, social media pressure and public pressure around that. They seemed to respond. You mentioned Jake Tapper and others asking tough questions. Some people are saying that things may be shifting in the coverage of um, Israel, the Israeli-Palestinian situation, and that that may be in part, especially on the media side rather than the political side, and that that may be in part because social media are giving people the other side of the story, and that's leading to pressure from social media and elsewhere to get uh, broader reporting. Do you think that is anything to that? Yeah, I think during this major flare-up and the last two major flare-ups, that's definitely been true with social media. 
And I think there's also a reflection of that in the polling. So Gallup did some polling on this issue, and they found that I think it was 51% of people under age of 30 uh, think Israel's actions are unjustified. And I believe a plurality of people under, I think it was 35, maybe agree, have the same view. Um, I think the the massive age, that's a massive age split, as every other age group pretty much is in support of the offensive. Um, and I think something only like 20, 25% are even supportive in that age group. So I think a big part of that is the split between how people are, are consuming their news. Um, on social media, uh, you're primarily, I think, seeing mostly in the Jewish Daily Forward wrote an article about this. You're primarily seeing pictures, video, on the ground stuff. Whereas in the newspapers, on television, you see a lot of editorializing, a lot of Israeli spokesmen or, or uh, members of Congress who are sympathetic to Israel or activists who are sympathetic to Israel. Um, so I think just seeing the raw information has changed a lot of the debate. And I think the, the polling on how young people are against this is is part of that. Um, and it, to me, it's really interesting that pretty much, particularly with the Democratic Party, every one of their constituency groups is polled to be against the, the offensive. Uh, that includes women, minorities, and uh, young people. And yet we still have not seen that filter up to the politicians. Um, I was very disappointed to see Jason Carter, who lives in my state, uh, you know, attend a Stand with Israel rally. And I had some choice words with some of his senior staff about that uh, behind the scenes, um, considering, you know, his grandfather had been very out front on this issue. Um, but I think that it's just the fact that politicians do really feel uh, like this is an opportunity just to show their pro-Israel bona fides. Um, there's plenty of people in the media who are sympathetic to that. There's a lot of donors who are sympathetic to that. In some parts of the country, you'd get votes for doing that. Although, Honestly, the vote thing is a little bit overplayed. There's most parts of the country people do not vote on foreign policy at all, let alone Israel. Um, but you know, I think politicians just tend to not be leaders. You know, they tend uh, they tend to be behind the trend, behind curves. And so I think it'll take a lot more of this to to, to flip the situation again. Um, a lot of people, probably my age, don't realize that in the 1980s and even in the early 1990s, you even had politicians like Mitch McConnell signing letters saying, you know, Israel should be ceding some territory, you know, it's not right to be doing land grabs, things like that, um, because our politics wasn't always so stridently pro-Israel as it is today. And I do think that it can flip once again. And I think that's why you're seeing Israeli spokespeople going on every single TV network, frantically arguing with people like Jake Tapper, because they are afraid that we may take a more even-handed approach in the future and that the political consensus that we have right now may just not hold. And now, when you mentioned Jason Carter, we should let people know that his grandfather is Jimmy Carter, and that uh, former president of the United States, of course, and uh, who has been very outspoken, written a book on this issue, compared the uh, Palestinian situation to a form of apartheid. He is, uh, there was a massive attempt, uh, as there have been with other critics on this issue, to discredit Carter, to marginalize, Jimmy Carter, to marginalize him from the conversation. Um, but what, it's interesting what you say about a potential shift here, and some of us do remember when, for example, it was not only acceptable to talk about moderating uh, some of Israel's more aggressive policies, but I think he, he, even uh, very dedicated Israeli supporters were committed to that uh, with the understanding or the belief that doing so was in is Israel's best interest as well, because it would help stabilize the region, it would help shore up international support, and so on. And and, and I think what we've seen, in a way, it seems to me, I'm curious to know if you agree, it seems almost like an analog to gun laws, where where we've seen the, the most hardcore adherence, a subset of a subset of the population, drive the debate with the result that they may wind up marginalizing even a broader position uh, than they want. But uh, do we have a situation here where we really have a small but very vocal subset driving this debate and polarizing it? Uh, you know, I think that that's a, that's a very good analogy. Um, you know, the NRA today is not like the NRA of 20 or 30 years ago even. You know, the NRA right. of actually uh, 70, 60 or 70 years ago was actively supporting gun control laws, you know, thinking that some of them were were reasonable and that, you know, it'd be, it'd be in the best interest of gun owners just to support some gun laws because, you know, they can't oppose everything. Um, and I think that the the main Israel lobby, which is APAC, is, has become the same way. Uh, you know, there's progressive figures out there today like MJ Rosenberg, David Sirota, who actually at one point worked for APAC. Um, today, they don't want anything to do with the organization because the organization has gone so far to the right. Uh, you probably are some analogs with the Christian right. Um, the Christian right today is actually probably 
in terms of sheer numbers is larger than APAC. Uh, I think I, I looked at their Facebook likes. They have something like 1.3 million Facebook likes is the, the group Christians Unite for Israel, whereas APAC only has like 66,000. 66, um, so I think the Christian right itself has become smaller in number. There is a lot less people who identify as Christian right than have ever identified that way in, in recent history. And yet, I think they become more fervent and more, you know, more intent on sort of tacking further and further to the right on this issue. Um, Senator Ted Cruz is an example of that. Ted Cruz postulated without any evidence whatsoever that the FAA uh, banned flights to Tel Aviv because uh, Obama was trying to punish Israel. Um, right. Now, the FAA is supposed to be above political influence, and if that was true, it'd be a massive scandal. Um, but the interesting thing was that Cruz and the Israelis themselves were calling on the FAA to lift that ban, which is also politicizing the FAA, right? So I with, think, um, and yeah. could have led to, tr and and could have led to tragedy, of course, because they were uh, 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 reportedly uh, call, uh, banning those flights because of fear of uh, missile attacks and so on. So uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But I do have to say, Zajelani, I think the analogy with the Christian right is also very apt, and I think you find younger generations of Christians are less likely to support the Christian right. We may find that younger generations of Jewish Americans, it seems to appear, uh, are less likely to support the APAC position. So we'll keep tracking this story. I hope uh, you'll come back and talk to us again about it. And thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you. We will be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour. We are back on the Zero Hour. Joining us now is economist Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Dean, thanks so much for joining us. And I want to start out by asking you about Janet Yellen. That it appears that she was saying that uh, that um, there are some bubbles forming, and and you uh, were one of those who saw the housing bubble when it seemed there was sort of collective blindness on that topic uh, in the first decade of this century. Um, she's saying, she said, valuation metrics in some sectors do appear substantially stretched, particularly those for smaller firms in the social media and biotechnology industries. Is she right? Is there a bubble forming there? And is it a significant one? Well, a couple points. First off, it's it's important to understand the enormous transformation in thought where a Fed chair sees it as their responsibility to deal with with asset mm -hmm. bubbles. You know, and I agree with this a hundred percent. But I just go back two thousand four. I was actually there. There was a big meeting, the, the American Economic Association convention every year, and there's hundreds and hundreds of sessions. But one of the really big sessions was kind of a tribute to Alan Greenspan because he was. You know, approaching the end of his tenure as as Fed chair, and he's really being celebrated. They had Mervyn King, who was the head of Bank of England, many other very prominent economists up there, all sort of paying tribute to him. And then when when Greenspan had a chance to speak, one of his main points was, you know, we know bubbles, uh, no big deal. You just let them run their course, and you know they burst, and you pick up the pieces. And he's patting himself on the back because he's going, that that's what happened with the stock bubble. Now, that's not my understanding, because it wasn't simple. We actually had, at that time, the longest period without job growth since the Great Depression. So that didn't seem to me a small matter at that time as the longest period. We've now had a longer period, but after the collapse of the housing bubble. But in any case, you know, that was the conventional wisdom, and everyone applauded. They said, oh, what a great man Alan Greenspan is. So the fact that here we are just 10 years later, and the Fed chair today, Janet Yellen, is very clear. We have to deal with asset bubbles. That's a big deal. So I think that's a huge transformation, 100% for the better, because asset bubbles, as we see, can be a very, very big deal and have wreak enormous havoc on the economy. So then the question is, okay, so is she doing the right thing? She pointed to the, the uh, biotech sector, to the social media sector. She also mentioned junk bonds as being overvalued. Right. And, you know, I, I think her points were very well taken. I guess what I'd say a couple things here. One, she made a point of saying that assets in general 
are not overvalued. So some people would be yelling about the stock market in general being overvalued. And she said no, and I think she's right on that. I look at that closely, and I, I agree, I concur. It might be high, you know, there's no no one, you know, neither she nor I nor anyone else has, you know, a crystal ball that tells them exactly where the stock market should be. But that's not a big deal in the sense, suppose it's 10% too high. I mean, if I had money in the market and it falls 10%, I won't be happy. But that's not going to have any big ramifications for the economy. It's, you know, it's when it's 50% too high, which is, right. you know, what we saw back in the late 90s. Um, so, so she was right on, you know, saying that. Now, then she picks these particular sectors, social media, uh, biotech, and junk bonds. My assessment is she's probably right on that. She gave evidence, looked at historical comparisons, and I think she had a good basis for that. Now, the one qualification I would say is that these sectors are not that large relative to the economy as a whole. And this is something I've often, a point I've often made in terms of, you know, the idea of the Fed chair talking about bubbles, you know, do you run a risk that, you know, they're they're like giving financial advice to everyone and right. you know, you don't expect them to be saying, Well, you know, Amazon's a little high, on the other hand you get a good deal right. if you bond to Delta. You know, that's not the Fed chair's job. <laughs> Now, right, now the, right. the, the, these sectors are larger than that, but if, you know, biotech were to fall 20%, 30%, 40%, that's not going to big impact for the economy. Same with the social media. You know, it'll have a big impact on, you know, people of a lot of those stocks, maybe some areas, you know, Silicon Valley may be sufficiently dependent right. on these. But, you know, for the economy as a whole, probably doesn't matter. My guess is that Yellen was quite consciously experimenting to see hmm. how the markets would react. Because this is kind of a radical idea. I've been saying it, but I'm used to economists yeah. getting in front of me for it. That, you know, if the Fed, you know, I don't mean <laughs> mumbling irrational exuberance, as Greenspan famously did back in 1996. Right. I mean, presenting the evidence. Here, these sectors are overvalued. Here's why. Here's the evidence. And I think that, will, that would have an impact, and the evidence is to date it did. So I think she may well have been testing that, that idea. So it might have been a trial balloon. It's interesting because she even she limited it to smaller firms in the social media and biotechnology industries. So a, a, a number of questions, Dean Baker, on this. One is that you know she said valuation metrics in some of the, in the sectors she named appear substantially stretched. So you're 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 thinking maybe she's uh, raising the idea that the Fed sh redefining the Fed chair, and this is almost a a sort of first foray into that um i guess uh but as to your broader point where she's saying and you're agreeing that the stock market isn't hyperinflated i mean I, I don't have a crystal ball either i just stand back and marvel and not in a good way necessarily at a stock market in the 17,000 range when we have such persistent unemployment underemployment a poor labor force participation, income inequality, wage stagnation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that I just see this, if the stock market isn't overvalued, are we seeing a kind of bifurcation of, is our economy splitting in two in effect, where there's a, a, a main street economy that's so isolated from the Wall Street economy that you can have a not inflated stock market that's so different from the experience of uh, most Americans? Absolutely. And, you know, again, this is something that, you know, it, it, it's painful to me that so many people, including I hear progressives say, you know, they talk about the stock market as though it's an economic measure. It's not. It's not a measure of the economy. It's a measure of corporate profitability. And corporate profits are very good, look like they'll be very good or high, I guess I should say, and not use the term good, but they're high, they're likely to be high for the foreseeable future, and that's determining stock market valuations. So when someone says, oh, you know, Obama's done a great job, you know, the stock market's doubled under his reign. Now, in fairness, it had fallen in half before he took office. So, you know, so you have to qualify that a little bit. But in any case, you know, that's not telling you Obama did a good job. What that's saying is that Obama did good for people who own stock, which, you know, is fine, but we want to see that he's doing well for the country as a whole, and that those are the measures that most of us care about, wage growth, job growth, people getting health care benefits. You know, that, that's, that's where most people live. So the stock market's not telling you the economy's good or bad. It's just telling you corporate profits are high, and that's true. So, but in traditionally, in traditional economy, I, I, look, I mean, as I perceive it, and as I think a number of people perceive it, uh, historically, though, that I, 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 your point well taken, it's clearly just an index of corporate profitability, but there used to be, it seems to me, more of a gravitational pull between corporate profits and and everyday economic experiences 
than there is now. I mean, I think, you know, 40% or whatever it is of corporate profits now coming from the financial sector, which is disconnected from whether people have or don't have jobs and, you know, the decline in manufacturing, globalization, whatever it is, it seems now, at least 40 years ago, if the stock market was up, there was a re- seemed like there was a reasonably good chance that people were doing better in their daily lives as well. Now it seems like there's a complete disconnect. Yeah, we could talk about this idea of a virtuous circle where, you know, back, this is here, I'm thinking the 40s, 50s, 60s, at least into the early 70s, where higher productivity translated into higher wage growth, that meant more demand, that increased corporate profits, companies would then reinvest, leading to, you know, further gains in productivity growth, further gains in wages, you know, on and on. So that that, that was sort of this virtuous cycle. So, you know, pro- companies gained, they got higher profits, but then that went back to workers because they would, you know, invest in, in in technology that improved productivity, which would lead to higher wages. That's long gone. So now you see corporate profits go up. Companies might pay it out in dividends, share buybacks. They might invest overseas. You know, so, so the, there's not a very direct link at all these days between corporate profits and their investment, at least their investment in the United States. So that's clearly been broken for a while and certainly very much broken in this recovery where we've seen very sharp uptick in corporate profits getting back uh, above, in fact, the pre-recession level, but investment uh, nowhere keeping pace with that. Well, I got a hypothetical for you then. If we were, and it's highly hypothetical, uh, if we were to restore, if we had a new government come in commit, and a new Congress and a new everything committed to restoring that virtuous circle, committing to reintegrating these segments of the economy, at that, you're going to say probably you hate the question or it's a stupid question, but at that point, would uh, would the stock market over overall be overvalued? I don't think so, because the flip side of this is that you might see some fall in, in profit shares, but keep in mind, we're somewhere around 6% below full employment. In other words, our economy could produce about 6% more than it actually is. So let's say we saw somewhat of a fall in the, the share of income going to profits, but at the same time, income rose by somewhere in the order of, let's just say, 6%. Now, the net might be a small negative for profits, but I don't think it would be a very large one. So I don't think we have to worry that if, you know, we get, you know, I think what you and I and many others would hope for, that we get see a situation where workers are, again, getting their share, their fair share of economic growth, that, that corporate profits will plummet. They might go down a little. I'm not going to guarantee they won't fall at all. But, you know, I don't see a story where they collapse. And there might be a shift in profit from one sector to another here and there. You might, right? I mean, you might Yeah, see well, that. you know, one of the things I certainly would hope for is a big shift away from finance, that, you know, we're seeing a lot right. of uh, profit earned by banks that are or financial firms that are basically shuffling money that, you know, it's not doing anything productive for the economy. So, you know, my hope would be their profits would go down quite a bit and a lot of those companies have got a business. And one of your big issues I know, and you've done a lot of research and thinking and advocacy on this, is um, the fact that for 30 years at least we had uh, wages tied to productivity in this country and then uh, that was severed also as I guess part of this disconnect of the virtuous circle if if we were able to restore that relationship again so that wages had a, a closer rela- uh, relationship to productivity, same thing, I mean, corporate profits wouldn't be hurt that badly, there might be some shift, or would that be a significant shift for the corporate world? Well, you know, again, what, what you would expect, or at least what I would expect, what I'd hope for, is that we see a story where the economy gets, you know, we see some downward shift in corporate profits in their shares, and then we're on a path where, let's say, the economy is growing two and a half, three percent a year. Profits are going two and a half, three percent a year, as are wages. You know, somewhere in that ballpark. You know, so so you end up with a situation where profits could still grow, um, but they're growing in line with the economy, in line with productivity, not growing at the expense of wages. So I had a I, I had a sort of master. I was leading somewhere with all of this, Dean Baker, a Center of Economic Policy Research. Uh, which is getting back to the Fed, circling back to the Fed now. So you've been you've been a, a strong advocate on this issue this week. Uh, Lawrence Katz from Harvard and EPI's Josh Bivens or was were, were getting on the issue of what the the Fed ought to do, uh, pointing out that there's uh, I guess what you and I have talked about before, kind of premature 
celebration of the idea that the economy, quote unquote, is restored and that uh, unemployment is getting into reasonable levels when in fact that's uh, just going off the employment rate is uh, the base unemployment rate is not enough and we're seeing significant. Uh, how do we make sure that the Fed and policymakers in general uh, stay focused on A, on uh, unemployment and underemployment and B, uh, strengthening wages, obviously, two interconnected problems. How do we make sure that we don't get uh, too contented too early? Whether we're talking about the federal, uh, the Fed's open market committee, or um, or policymakers in Washington. Well, this is something that that, that gets complicated because the Fed, you know, ostensibly they try to inf- separate it from politics, so it's difficult insulate from politics. So it's difficult for members of Congress to directly influence the Fed. But by taking away influence from Congress, basically they substitute in influence from the financial sector, which you know is, is obviously pernicious in the sense that the financial sector's interests are, are generally not closely aligned with those of the typical worker. So how do you affect that? Well, one, you know, use you know members of Congress should take responsibility. They do talk to the Fed chair. You know, Janet Yellen does testify at least twice a year. In fact, she's generally uh, testifying for before committees more than that. And you know, she should be pressed. I you know I have a lot of confidence in her. I think she's a very good Fed chair. But like anyone else, she's going to respond to pressure. And if it's all coming from the side, you know, the financial sector saying, "Oh, you got to do something about inflation." Um, she's going to feel that, you know, and she needs people, you know, uh, progressives saying, you know, look, keep your foot on the accelerator. We got to get the unemployment down. So members of Congress, you know, that's a really important point. The other part of the story, and this is where the Fed really gets convoluted. You have the 12 regional Fed banks, you know, they're, they're, they're spread around the country. There's one here in Richmond. Uh, there's one, uh, New York, of course, has the biggest, most important one, one in Philadelphia, St. Louis. I mean, it's so, so spread around the country. Those people, in principle, also could be pressured. I mean, people should mm-hmm. find out who their Fed bank president is, you know, send them letters, send the board members, the local Feds, the regional Feds, I should say, uh, letters, you know, let them know people are watching. Because as it stands now, those those Fed, you know, the, they all sit there. All 12 of those people sit on the open market committee. At any point in time, only five have a vote, but all 12 are sitting there. And the people they're answering most directly to are the banks in the district. Now, in principle, they're supposed to be representing all of us. So it's important that they know people are watching. And if they're going to say raise rates, meaning slow the economy, throw people out of work, they have to know we don't like that. Uh, their bankers right. might be fine with it, but they have to know they're supposed to represent the whole country. They're, is it you know the kind of a fluke? You may not want to say a fluke. It was obviously planned, but in any case, because of you know a quirk in the system, they were able to set it up so that the bankers actually control who gets sent there. But again, they they can't at least have our time saying publicly, "Well, screw you, the banks who put me here want low inflation." <laughs> so, so we have right. to let them know it- people are watching. Well, I think that's a great idea. I love the idea of taking it, taking the debate to the local feds. And, and of course, they're a diverse group. I, it seems to me that, for example, Richard Fisher, who I believe is the president of the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank, is a good guy with a lot of good ideas and others uh, less so. But am I right about, isn't it Fisher who's well, come up with some Well, they're very pro- mixed. What you find is Richard Fisher's been very good on regulatory issues. He wants to break up the large banks and that, you know, that I certainly applaud and very much sympathize with. On the other hand, on inflation, he's a real hawk. So he's <laughs> constantly on the guard saying, oh my God, we got to worry about inflation. We got to worry about inflation. Thomas Honig, who is, he's now the uh, vice chair of the FDIC, but for years he was the president of the Kansas City Bank. It was the same thing. He was great on banking regulation. You know, he considered the too-big-to-fail banks, you know, a real failure of the capitalist system because, you know, basically they're getting a subsidy from the government, you know, because everyone knows the government will bail them out. So he was very good on banking regulation, but he, too, was very much an inflation hawk. So he's always looking for inflation. You know, it's under the bed, you know, this and that. So, right. you know, you find people are like that, and, you know, I, I think they're both honest people. I think those are their real convictions. But, you know, again, they have to be pressured on this inflation issue and, you know, really come to grips. They, you know, they've been warning about inflation for years, and it's just not there. So it's not like this is a subjective thing that, you know, I like inflation, you like vanilla ice cream or something. You know, th- this right. is, you know, there can be threats of inflation. You know, we've seen cases where there's serious inflation, but it's not there now, and it's not likely to be there anytime in the near future, given what we know about the economy. 
Yeah, and it seems to me that that's just an analytical challenge that they've been saying if A then B, and we've had A without B. So you, it's, but but anyway, okay, that's a that's a conversation for another day. I, I I like where this wound up, which is basically think globally and act locally when you're looking at the the Federal Reserve and what it might want to do. So once again, as always, thanks so much for joining us, Dean Baker, co-director of the Center for Economic and Policy Research. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me in. You bet. I am Richard R.J. Escal. We will be back after this. This is The Zero Hour. This is The Zero Hour with R.J. Escal, produced by the We Act Radio Network in Washington, D.C., and broadcast across the nation. Visit us online at thisisthezerohour.com or at youtube.com slash thezerohour. Ladies and gentlemen, R.J. Escal. Hello, everybody. We're back on The Zero Hour. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and I want to talk to you about Walgreens. Walgreens is the pharmacy that, at least according to its website, can be found at the corner of Happy and Healthy. The first Walgreens was opened in 1901 at the corner of Bowen Avenue and Cottage Grove Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. So if that's not an American company, what is? But if its executives have its way, it will soon be found near the intersection of Ziegelacherstrasse and Untermatweg in Bern, Switzerland. By acquiring a much smaller Swiss company located at that address, the American company can dodge millions in American taxes. So, what would becoming a Swiss company mean for the 4,200 employees who work at Walgreens headquarters in Deerfield, Illinois? Mm, Probably nothing, because it's something called an inversion. So nothing actually moves. Uh, Walgreens becomes a Swiss company, but it stays right there in Deerfield. Uh, So, you know, Walgreens, I mean, come on, what do Americans, especially older Americans, picture when they think about Walgreens? Probably a 1950s style corner drugstore with a luncheon at counter, some stools. Maybe there's one of those gleaming blenders where they whip up milkshakes. Uh, Some people like strawberry, I prefer chocolate. But today's Walgreens is a $72 billion corporate enterprise, and a quarter of that income comes directly from American taxpayers through Medicare and Medicaid. That's the truth. And when Americans think of Swiss corporations, which is what Walgreens is considering becoming, they might think of multinational banks or watches or maybe fine chocolate. They probably aren't picturing the pharmacy which sells them aspirin, shampoo, or prescriptions down on the corner. They're certainly not imagining a corporation which earns its wealth from American customers, profits from American government programs, and delivers its product over American roads all while scheming to evade American taxes. You could call this the inversion evasion. Walgreens would become a Swiss company for tax avoidance purposes only. The combined corporation would do a small percentage of its business in Switzerland and elsewhere, but in all of the other respects, it would remain fully headquartered. uh, I'm sorry, fully American. Headquartered here, making most of its profits here, and continuing to use its lobbying dollars and campaign money to distort the political process here. The inversion, evasion hasn't received much public attention, but it's quickly moving into the spotlight. Senator Dick Durbin has already written a letter suggesting that Walgreens could become the subject of a boycott if it decides, or pretends might be a better word, to become a Swiss corporation. You know, Durbin in his letter, he couldn't resist a jab at that corner of happy and healthy slogans either. Walgreens had a lot of taglines like that, including be well and the pharmacy America trusts the pharmacy America trusts as Ed McMahon used to say on the Johnny Carson show write your own joke and you know the CEOs must be feeling the heat because Heather Bresch who's this who's the head of a pharmaceutical company called Mylan called uh, called in some favors to get a very favorable article written about herself in the New York Times she is the daughter of US Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia a Democrat and the headline given to the article about her reads and and I'm not making this up Reluctantly, Patriot flees homeland for greener tax pastures. Reluctantly, Patriot flees homeland for greener tax pastures. Can you imagine if people did that in their love lives? 
reluctantly loving husband flees wife for a younger woman the fact is it's a betrayal now why is she going heather brush doesn't have a real complaint statutory corporate tax rates the official rate yeah they're high in the u.s but the actual rate paid by corporations after they're done with their loopholes is actually very much on the low end in this country it's just that there'll always be another country out there willing to charge a little less no matter how low our rates in return for draining some profits out of the u.s economy so the policy choice is simple Either end the inversion evasion, you might call it the inversion perversion, or be condemned to an endless race to the bottom on tax rates. That's an Ameri- That's a race that the American people are doomed to lose. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is The Zero Hour. We are back on the Zero Hour. Joining us right now is Diane Russ Tierney, Executive Director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. She has made a statement in the wake of the horrific botched execution of Joseph Woods in Arizona. Diane, thanks so much for joining us. Having me. You bet. Now, uh, let me start with this. I mean, it's a complex issue. It should be simple. I mean, either it's moral for the state to to uh, kill a human being, a captive human being, or it is not. But uh, I consider it immoral. But it's a complicated issue politically in that sometimes the opposition to it comes not from the state putting someone to death, but from the state's inability, seeming inability to put people to death in a humane and painless way. And um, you said in your statement uh, after Joseph Woods uh, was executed, Americans have had enough of the barbarism more than, and then uh, a little further down, that's why a growing number of us, more than 90 million Americans, oppose the death penalty, say they oppose the death penalty, a number that has grown significantly in recent years. So the death penalty, more people oppose it than ever, but is it still something that has uh, majority support in this country? It actually doesn't. I mean, I think that what we've seen in uh, the, the polling recently, particularly since we've seen this this uh, spate of, of botched executions, is that public support has gone down. Uh, a Pew Research Center report found that about 55% of the public, just a little over half, and then when you give the public uh, an alternative like life without parole, we see the number drop even below that to around the 40, 41. And so uh, the, the, the death penalty does not have the support that it once had. When I worked on this issue um, for many years ago, we had public support at around the 70 and 80 percent uh, level, and, and it really has dropped precipitously. Um, we saw uh, after the Troy Davis execution where millions of Americans saw that we have a system of justice that is quite prepared to execute innocent people. Um, that had a great impact, and I think in these recent weeks when we've seen these terrible botched executions, um, we've seen that um, the public support has waned as well. Well, uh, uh, that's good to hear, and I would say that uh, if I were to categorize or simplify, try to simplify reasons to oppose the death penalty, I would say, number one, it's immoral. Uh, and I think the Catholic Church, I know the Catholic Church agrees with me, many religious groups agree, many secular groups agree, so there's the issue of morality. There's the issue of justice. At a time when we're seeing more and more cases, thanks to the Innocence Project and other groups, more and more cases of people who've been in prison for 20, 30 years being found that they were uh, unjustly convicted, that evidence was suppressed, or that they, you know, whatever, that we're seeing people who, at least after losing 25 years of their lives, as someone uh, recently did upon release, that at least they can be released. But if you execute um, an, an innocent person, there is no um, going back on the injustice. So there's the injustice argument. I guess I would say there are four. Um, the third that everybody seems to forget is that aggressive prosecutors, when they prosecute the wrong person, let the guilty party go free. Um, and the fourth is the one that you mentioned in your statement, which is the uh, these inhumane uh, ordeals that are sometimes inflicted upon the condemned person. So with Joseph Woods, um, basically it was a ordeal of, I think, almost two hours, if not two hours. What happened? Well, we don't know all of what happened, and that's why an independent investigation 
uh, should take place. And I think that's what the what the crux of the, the fight was about leading up to his execution. Um, we uh, did not know in advance what drugs um, they were going to use and what exact protocol. Uh, but what we think happened is that they used probably the same drugs that were used in other botched executions in Ohio, where the prisoners struggled and gasped for air, we're told, for 20 minutes. Uh, and we also believe it might have been the same protocol that were used in, in, in Oklahoma as well. But, 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 but the part of the problem really is that the states don't know what they're doing. And through um, in, invoking sort of secrecy laws, uh, they are sort of doing this undercover of night, and there isn't the oversight. And so we just have a mess on our hands here with regard to the death penalty. Um, just a couple of points. I mean, I think at the end of the day, the, the points that you're making, it, it's all moral. Whether you oppose the death penalty uh, as a moral question, saying the state shouldn't kill, or uh, it's above our pay grade to decide who should live and who should die. Uh, but we also have a moral question in a, the way that we apply the death penalty. Is it moral to have a death sentencing process that sentences the guilty along with the innocent? Is it moral right. to have a process where the governors are actually behaving recklessly when it comes to actually carrying out the execution? And that's, you know, we assume for political reasons, because there are states where it may represent, like Texas, where it may represent some sort of advantage on their part. We also have the case of Bill Clinton, and I believe his name was Billy Ray Rector or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, this becomes a political issue, which certainly seems moral to me, no matter whether or not, as you say, whether or not you believe a state should have this right. It shouldn't be a politicized process. And right. then I guess the other piece of it is it's also uh, it seems awfully immoral when the people who are subject to the death penalty are very disproportionately minority or in other, uh, you know, subsets of the population suggests that this is not a justly applied process. Is that a fair statement? That's, and that is a very fair statement. In fact, you know, the death penalty really is at odds with our other values about the respect for the dignity of the individual, certainly our respect and you know, the importance of equal protection under the law. But let me say something else about this, this question about the politics, because this is what's really sort of on the, the moral question as well. The politics on this issue has changed dramatically. It is not true that First of all, the public is rapidly in support of the death penalty. We talked about that. The intensity and the passion for this issue is not on the side of people who think it might be all right to have the death penalty. The passion is on the side of folks who know that it's wrong and it's time to end. And moreover, the public is not vote against people because they have concerns about the death penalty. To the contrary, the public is looking for leadership that tells the truth that has integrity, that, that is grounded in some kind of values. And what everything that I'm seeing in terms of the people that we're talking to, uh, the people who support our position, is that if there's any political uh, benefit, it's being on the side of the, of the people who are saying we need moral leadership. Uh, so the notion that you have to be for the death penalty, you have to have a zillion executions to be politically popular is just wrong. Well, that's an important point, and it's one I hope more politicians hear. But let me ask you a slightly different question. You're executive, Diane Russ Tierney, you're executive director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty. What brought you into this struggle yourself? Well, I have to say, it, it started uh, about the way I was raised. Um, I was raised in the Christian faith, and I was raised to believe that there was a, a spark of the divine in each of us, and that, you know, whatever you do to the least of these, so shall you do unto me. Uh, and so we you know, see that there's room for redemption. Uh, we see that, you know, again, as I said, it's above our pay grade to decide who should live and who should die. So that was the moral sort of background that I brought into this work. Um, and it was, you know, it was with me from a, from being from a child. Uh, as I got into it as a lawyer and a policy advocate, you know, I was astounded by the degree to which the facts uh, bore out the, 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 the reality that this is a, a terribly flawed institution. And so I think that my passion for this issue is fueled by my belief that uh, there is value in everyone, even someone who's done the worst of the things, and that what we should be doing as a society is seeking to heal uh, and not to impose more suffering. Uh, and, and quite frankly, a, 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 um, a disgust at the kind of arrogance that uh, government, government officials would uh, assert to decide, you know, who and when and how uh, to kill a citizen. So, uh, it, I came into this from my faith tradition, but I have continued to, to struggle and fight in this area because I see that the facts are so much on our side. 
And speaking of the facts on um, on the death penalty, how many developed nations continue to impose the death penalty on their citizens? The United States continues to be uh, in the minority. I mean, I think that um, we are looking at it, developing nations like developed nations like Saudi Arabia and China and Japan uh, among the states that continue to have the death penalty, and the the rest of the world, the European Union in particular, is just desperate for the United States to to come out on the side of human rights and in the death penalty. And so um, we have some 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 strong allies, and as we know in this world, we have much work to do uh, to to bring the whole world forward in the area of human rights. And so I'm I am hopeful that the United States can soon end the death penalty, and we can really uh, add our strong shoulders to the overall world world effort to bring about human rights. Well, I think we've covered a lot of reasons why the death penalty death penalty doesn't make sense, from the spiritual to the strictly pragmatic to the political, and pretty much every place in between. Now, where can people go to learn more about your organization and the work you guys are doing? Well, they should come to our website, uh, which is ncadp.org. Uh, they will learn about our new 90 Million Strong campaign, where we really are reaching out to and mobilizing the millions of Americans who believe that the death penalty is wrong and should end, uh, and find out how you can get engaged. This is going to continue as long as we are not engaged. And so uh, the more hands there are, the more voices there are, the more people educating their neighbors and, and their churches and their neighborhoods, um, the sooner we're going to see the end of the death penalty. Well, I may be reading this into your um, literature, or I may not, but what I hear from you is a two-step process. It begins with a moratorium on all executions so that we can have a national debate about this, followed by, hopefully, I almost said God willing, an elimination of the death penalty uh, from our po public policy. Is that a fair statement of where you guys that, stand? That is a fair statement. Certainly now, we, our position right now is that no more executions should go forward anywhere. Uh, as long as we've seen these horrible uh, botched executions. We don't know what happened in any of these cases, and the notion that anybody in any state should be executing anyone um, at this point is, is an abomination, and so we, that is exactly what we believe. And I would only add to that, as long as there's a chance that we would be executing an innocent person, which the uh, recent uh, releases of long-term prisoners show we have, then that's another reason not to do it. So, uh, Diane Rustierney... Executive Director of the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, thanks for your uh, wonderful work, and thanks so much for joining us on the Zero Hour. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, you bet. We'll be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escal, and this is the Zero Hour. Back on the Zero Hour with us, I'm Richard R.J. Escow, and joining us now is a good friend of the program, a writer for Pando Daily, stays on top of the uh, the uh, shenanigans in the Silicon Valley, Yasha Levine. Yasha, thanks so much for joining us. I'm glad to be back. Hey, listen, man. Uh, okay, here's the thing. Um whenever it was that I downloaded the Tor browser when everybody was freaking out about internet security before Ed Snowden made his revelations and all that, I had this thought as I was downloading it, which is like, am I just now like flagging myself for the NSA and if they weren't watching me before, they're totally watching me now because I downloaded Tor browser for our listeners who don't know is a browser that was created and marketed as absolutely anonymous. People can't tell what you're doing. People can't track you. Government can't track you and all that. And when I downloaded it, I had this, then I thought, nah, I'm just being paranoid. Um, but you've been writing about Tor, and you mind telling us a little bit about what you found out? Uh, yeah, sure. So, I mean, uh, simply put, you know, so this Tor uh, anonymity browser uh, is supposed to protect you online, protect your identity, hide your identity from anybody who might be watching, whether it's your ISP or some, you know, bad government agency uh, trying to understand what you're doing, trying to profile you. Uh, it's supposed to hide your identity. And, you know, what I found out <clears throat> was that this uh, anonymity tool was uh, built, uh, financed, and is currently funded by the U.S. military intelligence complex. Uh, so I'm talking about... Uh, the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Defense grants. I'm talking about CIA-connected propaganda outfits that run Voice of America. I'm talking about State Department grants um, that are um, dedicated to promoting um, freedom and democracy abroad. So it's 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 pretty much uh, a kind of a privatized 
um, project of the U.S. government that was initially developed and designed in the U.S. Naval Labs in D.C. And um, it was designed primarily for, um, not for, not for consumer uh, use, but for um, intelligence use. It was designed primarily to hide uh, the identity of spooks, of intelligence agents and assets online as they went about their business online. So that's the sort of short answer. So there's there's two ways to take that information, okay? And um, there's one less paranoid, one more paranoid. Call me paranoid. I'm going to lean toward the more paranoid. But I'll tell you what, how I reacted to that that reporting that you did in Pando Daily on it. The first uh, is that, okay, a bunch of guys got together and created this secure uh, technology for the intelligence community, which needs to operate in secrecy, and it's really good. So then, nobly and kindly, they made it available at no charge for the community of leftist libertarians and free thinkers of all stripes who don't want to be spied on, and just because they're good guys. Okay, that's the benevolent interpretation of the information you brought to light. The other is, what a great way to trap the suckers, because we will give them something that will make them think they're anonymous, and then we can really spy on them and really find out what they're up to. Now, I'm asking you to go beyond the bounds of reporting into speculation here, but uh, if you had to guess, which of those interpretations would you endorse? I'd say both, <laughs> and neither. <laughs> um, uh-huh. I, I, <laughs> Uh, well, it's like this, because the, the reason why it was made available wasn't because they were saying, hey, you know what, like, this is such a great tool, we'll just release it to the public. Um, the reason it was made available to the public, really, was because that's part of its design. See, because if you have an anonymity network that only military agents or, you know, military personnel <laughs> and intelligence agents and various spooks use, then it's not an anonymity, not, you know, they, people might not know who they are or where they're going, but, you know, it's pretty obvious whoever is watching if you're an ISP in, you know, in, in Syria or in Iran and, and, you know, there's a CIA agent sitting in a hotel, hotel room in Tehran, you know, and you, you see someone logging on to the Tor network, you might not know, you know, what website they're going to, but you know that that person is a spook or is a military uh, or a U.S. Um, right. you know, intelligence asset of some kind, you know, uh, and so you're going to be watching him. So what you need in order for this anonymity tool to work, what you need is for everybody to use it. Right? You need not just spooks using it, you need, you know, uh, soccer moms, you need, um, you need, you know, hackers, you need students, you need paranoid, uh, you know, Alex Jones fans, you need people like <laughs> you, you and me who, you know, might be doing some research on the web and, and, don't, and are kind of scared of being tracked by whoever. Um, right. So you need all these people using them. And so then, so then, the, you know, so then these spies essentially can hide in plain sight on the Internet like in a crowd, like in a crowded square. And so, in that right. sense, <laughs> it does work. You know, you know, it all depends. But at the same time, because the, the surveillance capabilities of, of our government are so vast um, that they don't necessarily mind that you make it a little harder for them to track you or to uncloak you. So, but they, they, they don't mind that you that this that one of the one of the, the side effects of this of this tool is that it drives. Um, you know, all the people who might be paranoid or might, might ha- actually have something to hide into it. And so it, in a way, it like self-selects people for, yeah, for further surveillance. And in fact, one of the things that prompted me to write the story was um, recent reporting that was published in the German press a few weeks ago about how um, there was uh, some documents that are associated, I think, with Edward Snowden. It wasn't clear where they came from, but there was some leak from the NSA um, that showed that the NSA was targeting <clears throat> people, everyone who was even interested in Tor, let alone, so if you use Tor, or if you downloaded Tor, even, right, it basically flagged you for, you know, ultimate surveillance, like total surveillance right. of everything. Right. And so in, in that sense, you weren't, you, you weren't paranoid. You were right. And, and, and so <clears throat> because, you know, they, the NSA might not be able to uncloak you right away, they can pretty much record all your traffic, and then play with it later on uh, if they want. Right. So and so it'll, and so in that way it it, it 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 has a dual function, which is kind of a brilliant thing uh, if you think about it. It it, it does you know offer anonymity to 
uh, intelligence types on the internet. Uh, and then it also sort of uh, uh, herds people who have something to hide on the same network and, and self-selects them for, for surveillance. <laughs> right, and um, since and, they yeah. presumably no, know who they are, the, all the people who aren't them are people they want to look at. So exactly. It, it, exactly. it it does make a kind of creepy sense. And by the way, I saw that article too. I, I guess it was Der Spiegel or one of those papers. But one of the things that freaked me out about that article was the fact that it never got, as far as I know, picked up by the American press, which was a little creepy too when you think about it. Well, you know, the creepiest thing about that article too was that it was written by three people and those three people were all Tor developers. So they were all developers of the Tor browser and actually, you know, on, on the payroll of the, of the Tor network, which is funded by the U.S. government. So, like, I, you know, it's a, it's a kind of, a, you know, you know one of, that's one of the things I get into my, into my article. It's like when you start to look at this stuff, it doesn't really, it's, things begin to lose meaning uh, because it's like, wait a second, so wait. So these guys are working for the U.S. government, are being paid by the U.S. government to create a, a tool that helps the U.S. government spy on us, and yet they're also disclosing information that shows that the U.S. government is sort of uh, uh, attacking and trying to uh, you know, uncloak people who use Tor. <laughs> so this is the this is the point in the story where I'm really glad I don't smoke weed anymore because I just my brain can't handle it. You know, I mean, is it that they're throwing us off? track by doing this is that they, they want people to be paranoid is it a is it a triple blind game in order because tor really works and they want you to think it doesn't work and they want you to stop using it i mean we don't know yeah, do we? Or, like, or, or it's or it's, or it's in, in, injecting some sort of credibility into the whole tour and if you want to get another layer <laughs> of it you know because there's been a lot right. of criticism lately of tor and a lot more you know uh a lot more just attention on you know what is what is it uh, you know, who uses it, uh, what, are, what, what is its history? And so is it, you know, to sort of whitewash TOR's uh, back, you know, history and, and, and background by, by having these TOR developers, you know, go against the, the surveillance state and say, hey, look, the surveillance state is trying to undermine this, this great tool. You know, there's a lot of questions um, that are very difficult no to kidding. answer uh, because, uh, you know, it's like the fact that Edward Snowden ran Tor nodes and, and ran these really uh, powerful Tor servers that people w would use. Um, there are exit, exit nodes in the Tor network where you know, the exit Tor node in the Tor network is like the most vulnerable thing because that's where you can just observe all the traffic that's exiting the network and going into the real internet. So it, it's like a, it's, the NSA is known to run Tor nodes to, in order to just observe the traffic going through that network. It might not know who is whose traffic it is, right? But it can just observe the content of that traffic. And sometimes oh, really? that's enough. Yeah. Well, uh, let me, so for example, if, if, if I were to use Tor to do a search on, I don't know, Islamic fundamentalism in Yemen, that it wouldn't know it was me, but it would know that somebody was researching Islamic fundamentalism in Yemen. Exactly. So the, the, the point, the way that the Tor network, network, the Tor network works is that it, um, it separates the request from the destination. Um, so it's kind of, you know, uh, it takes the, 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 your return, right? Um, let's say imagine it's an envelope and you have a return address. It sort of right. takes that information off of the envelope and, and sort of, and, and so, and kind of puts, puts a firewall between the two, the two pieces of information. So someone can know where something is going and someone can know where it's coming from, but they're not the same person or not the same server right so and then it sort of anonymizes you in that in that way so so there's a so when you use this tor network tor tool you enter a sort of a parallel network and so let's say your isp like verizon will see you entering a tor network right a node and then that your that request will like bounce around this sort of parallel network and then will exit out the other side and it, that that exit node might be someone's computer in, in a dorm room. That, it might be my computer. I actually, you know, played around with running a tour node several years ago just because I was interested. I was curious about it. Uh -huh. um, you know, it might be, you know, coming out of my uh, computer. It might be coming out of Edward Snowden's NSA tour node. He ran several. Right. It might be coming out of, you know, a, a Russian tour node <laughs> run by the right. FSB. Um, and, and so you don't know. But if you run it, and so at that point, 
whoever runs that exit node can see the traffic and can see where it's going, right? But it, and 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 it doesn't know where it came from. So we're talking with Yasha Levine of Pando Daily, and, and and okay. So now, if I were to, and then I have an a, an alter yet alternate theory, but if I were to uh, put myself in the shoes of an intelligent a, intelligence agency that was actually trying to do the right thing, right? I mean, uh, mm -hmm. protect us from terrorist attacks, all that stuff. That's not stupid. I mean, you know, it, it, you don't know if there's a sudden surge of, uh, I, although it doesn't make sense, but I was going to say, if, if there's a sudden surge of searches in, let's say, you know, how to get past airport security in Atlanta, uh, I don't even yeah. know how to get to the gate in Atlanta. It's so complicated. But it, 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 it get back, then, you know, okay, then they can alert the Atlanta authorities to be on guard or whatever, be extra vigilant. So that part kind of makes sense to me. But otherwise, it seems kind of vague, and it gets into, remember, like, it's out of fashion now, but like 10 years ago, we kept hearing about chatter. There's a lot of chatter on the, it's kind of a chatter, <laughs> right? Yeah, it is kind of chatter. Well, look, the thing that I think that well, the thing that I don't like or found troubling about the way that Tor is presented and sold to to consumers, you know, to just people on the internet, uh, and to journalists, to activists, especially, you know, to people who might have something to hide and actually are trying to use this for legitimate purposes and not just to you know hide their porn activity, right? Their porn watching activity, you know, but they are trying to hide from. Maybe they are in a hostile uh, country of some kind, and, and they're, you know, they're political activists, and they are trying to protect their identity, and it could actually put them in danger if this tool isn't what it's, uh, isn't what it's right. advertised to be. And so, and so what I found disturbing was the disconnect between the sort of the original reality and, and the purpose of, of Tor and the way that it's presented to us uh, right. consumers and, and just users. And so the, the ultimate and, you know, and the current purpose of Tor it's just a very simple purpose, and its purpose is for, for intelligence, for, for military intelligence, for um, agencies like the NSA, agencies like the FBI, uh, various law enforcement agencies, even local police departments. You know, it's for them. It's for, it's for them to, go on, to be able to go online and not have people be able to trace back their identity, you know, uh, their, use, their, their identity back to who they are. So if you're an FBI agent and you're... Um, you know, trying to set up a, a, a drug deal online and trying to bust one of these, you know, online um, uh, drug forums where you can just purchase stuff online with bitcoins, right? You don't want to have to, if that FBI agent wants to be able to register on that forum, you know, anonymously and not have that registration IP address, right, tied back to, his, to, the, to you know, an FBI.gov domain name of some kind, right? Uh, right. So the, it's, a, it's about cloaking yourself, and it's, you know, and so it's, that's one of you. So I, um, it's frequently used by the FBI for intel intelligence gathering online, for you know infiltrating forums, for pretending to be someone they're not online, right? right? All the time. And uh, then there's you know when you're a uh, agent, uh, like a secret agent operating in hostile territory, and you need to dial back using the internet, but you don't want to just tell everybody who's you know in the hotel that you're staying at or in the you know in that country's ISP <laughs> that's being monitored. That you are, an, you know, a CIA agent, um, you know, posing as a tourist, right? So that's an important thing, and so that that is what Tor is. It's a, it's a it's an anonymity tool for spooks, <laughs> and right. the no, anonymity I, that I, it offers I, for us is just like uh, sort of a you know tangential to. I get that. I mean, we're all the people in the movie, the conversation. We're all the people in the park who aren't Gene Hackman. You know, I mean, that's like exactly. that's. We're That's our role. I get extras. We need the extras. They need extras <laughs> to be there just to hang out, you know? Okay, now yeah. here's my theory about the rest of it, okay? Which is, it's possible that they're paying double and triple games and trying to confuse us and using it as an intelligence gathering tool. Isn't it also possible that they're just, like, really disorganized? That they just, like, oh, some people are writing about it because, like, they don't know any better and they're not part of the, like... I, I don't know. I'm just guessing here, but I'm, I just find it very confusing. I, I agree with you. I agree with you. You know, I think the, one of the one of the mistakes that a lot of uh, people who, like, uh, I, you know, I, I guess I can be called a conspiracy theorist, but you know, a lot. I think a lot of people who go a little bit too far in the conspiracies is is believing that there's a master plan that there, you know there, there's an ultimate 
ultimate reality of some kind, if we just broke through this, you know, a, a certain levels of barriers of secrets, of secrecy, that we would get right. to the ultimate truth. And I think, for the most part, you know, folks are just like the rest of us. And uh, they're, you know, like, they're, like any other kind of bureaucracy. Uh, that right. there is a plan of some kind, you know, a lot of, but there's personalities involved, there's, uh, you know, promotions involved, there's you know, power plays involved within the organization, whatever it is. And, and so, yeah, so I don't know if the, the guys that, you know, that wrote that um, uh, article exposing how the NSA was targeting Tor uh, users, you know, if there was like some kind of really sinister um, uh, you know, trick that they're playing on us and to confuse us. I don't, I don't, I don't know. I don't, and I don't probably don't think so. Started there might be somebody I, back in Washington just saying, I can't believe they wrote that. We told them not to write that. You know, maybe nothing more than that. You know? But, you know, but, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. Because it is an open source project. Um, there's been a lot of criticism. And, in fact, um, just last year, one of the original designers of um, Onion Routing Technology, which is the, is the, the technology behind Tor, and actually Tor's logo is an onion. And so Onion Routing, it's like... That's the that's the technology that runs it. The guy that invented mm -hmm. it is, is a is a is a is a mathematician and um, and um, an engineer that who works for the Navy. Uh, he's a military mathematician, and he you know he's in the U.S. Naval Labs, and he still works there. And he was one of the guys that developed it in, in 1995. Uh, and he wrote just published a paper last year that talked about all the vulnerabilities of the Tor network and how. Right. Oh, you know, we're going to we're running out of time, but I forgot to ask you about these guys who were going to run a test showing how they could break the anonymity of Tor and the authorities shut them down. So I guess we'll yeah. have to save that one for next time. But, you know, you can't beat the symbol of the onion and the metaphor of the onion. We keep peeling off more and more layers. And, you know, once you're done peeling off the all the layers of the onion, there's no onion left. So we <laughs> there may exactly. be nothing. You know, uh, but anyway, listen, we'll keep on this. Thanks for all your great reporting. Thanks for coming on the show. Yasha Levine, Pando Daily. Always great to talk to you. Thanks for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. And we will be back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Escow. And as you know, this is The Zero Hour. WEACT Radio Network, produced in Washington, D.C. Visit us online at weactradio.com.